Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jay Wegman, and I am the director of Skirball, and I welcome you here to Skirball Talks. Um, it's our Monday night series of public conversations, lectures, whatever, and uh, tonight we've got a really great lineup. I want to say that um, tonight's evening is taking place on a set that is being, <laughs> of uh, Pirates of Penzance that is being performed here. So it doesn't always look like this. It, we try to make it look a little bit nicer, but just to plug Pirates of Penzance, Ben Brantley, New York Times critic, gave it a critic's pick. It's really great. So if you have any inclination to come back, please do. Um, and I also want to thank, we, this is a new series, but we were just awarded, uh, even though we've, this is our eighth one, a, a really great grant from, um, sorry, uh, Humanities New York, which is a state funding organization to uh, promote the humanities in the public. So we're really, really grateful to them. And I'm now going to introduce Lisa Coleman, who is the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion, Diversity, and Strategic Innovation. She is NYU's first Chief Diversity Officer. Thank you, Jay. Good evening, everyone. I'm so pleased to be part of this event this evening. On behalf of the university, um, and of course, as Jay has mentioned, the entire team, I want to welcome you all here this evening. I, I was backstage earlier listening to our panelists, and I can promise you this will be a stimulating and invigorating exchange. I suspect I'm not the only one who has noticed that, by and large, our national conversation about race and politics in the recent years has not been particularly elevated sometimes, informed, or civil. So it's extremely important to have opportunities like this one to have a nuanced and productive discussion, far removed from the com uh, comments section, editorials, or the latest tweets. As we consider the state of race and politics here in our nation, here at NYU, we are also working to make the university as inclusive and equitable as possible. Conversation is a big part of that undertaking as well. And in my first few months as the inaugural, as NYU's inaugural chief diversity officer, I have been talking with, and more importantly, listening to students, faculty, and staff across this large and complex institution. And the current climate assessment being at NYU is one opportunity to help us understand how everyone in our environment and community experiences NYU. If you have not heard of the assessment being at NYU, please, please, please visit the website being at NYU and take the assessment. We are committed to serious and thoughtful dialogue and to involving the members of our community in these dialogues even when dialogue is hard or painful, since that is the best way to make meaningful change and progress. With a superb lineup of panelists this evening's conversation, as I've already mentioned, will be illuminating, and even more so because it is bipartisan. I wanna thank our panelists in advance for taking the time to come to be with us this evening. Our moderator, Jonathan Capehart, is a member of the Washington Post editorial board and writes about politics and social issues for the Postpartisan blog and is a contributing, uh, as, as a contributor uh, appearing regularly on MSNBC. April Ryan has been the White House correspondent for American Urban Radio Networks for the past two decades. She is also the author of the best-selling book, The Presidency in Black and White, My Up-Close View of Three Presidents and Race in America. Her new book, At Mama's Knee, looks at race through lessons that mothers transmit to their children. And Michael Steele, the former Republican, chair of the Republican National Committee and lieutenant governor of, of Maryland, is a political analyst for MSNBC and a frequent contributor on the Fox News Channel. He is the author of Right Now, a 12-step program for defeating the Obama agenda. I would like to also note that the NYU bookstore is selling copies of both April and Michael's books and Skirball Lobby, and there will be an opportunity, a brief opportunity, to have those signed after the event, so we hope you will join us there. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you to our panelists, and now I will turn it over to Jonathan. <laughs> Hi. 
April Ryan, Hello. Michael Steele. You've been, you've been given the bios, you know, you've been told our personal life histories and stories, you, you, you know who we are, so let's just dive right into this. And just fair warning, after I ask the first question, this thing is just, I don't know where it's gonna go, <laughs> because um, you will soon see, if you don't already know, we've known each other a long time, We've done lots of television together. And even one time, I, on, on, before you signed with CNN, April, and we were all doing hardball together, remember we were all excited. The three of us were going to be on a, yes. the reporter's roundtable with Chris yes. Matthews. And by the time we got to the studio, they were like, mm, no, that's a little too much heat. <laughs> so they separated, they, they peeled steel off and put, left April Typical. and I on. But Typical. They so, separated us. So the whole point of this conversation is to talk about race in politics, race, well, race and politics. And you both have been in Washington for a long time mm -hmm. mm. Um, from different vantage points. Michael Steele from politics, April Ryan from journalism, and just briefly, and I'll start with, I'll start with you, Chairman Steele, to talk about how race has changed in the, in the relatively short time from when you were elected chairman of the Republican Party, which was in 2009, Nine. Nine, yeah. to President Trump, and April, how race and politics has, have changed from your perspective as a White House reporter sitting in the White House press briefing room, starting with Clinton, yes, and now President Trump. Chairman Steele. Well, first off, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, you know, I, I think your, your question presumes something that I don't think exactly, is exactly correct, that somehow it, the, the issue of race uh, had fundamentally changed or is changing or got to a point where um, there is more change today between, you know, Trump, my term in 2009 to Trump. My, my argument on race is just how subtle it has become mm. over time just how uh, much more it's still ingrained in the bloodstream of America life, culture, politics, business. Um, and certainly as we see in communities and have seen in communities across the country, um, how it plays itself out every day. Uh, what the president did uh, was basically give it uh, more public license, President Trump. Uh, but I would submit, I remember having conversations shortly after Barack Obama got elected and everybody was talking about, we in a post-racial America. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what you're sipping, but they ain't where we are. <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, uh, the idea that you had elected a black president uh, sort of took some of the baggage of race off the backs of people who still needed to carry that baggage. Uh, and I think that that's really the unspoken truth about race. So the difference between nine and, and uh, 17 is uh, we just a little bit more out about it than we were. Uh, then it kind of gone underground. Look, we had, the, we had the marches, we had King gave a great speech. Um, you had um, you know, affirmative action. You had all these little milestones where people in life, in, in American life could sit back and go, Oh, yeah, we, we're doing good. This is really good. Hercules, Hercules. Right. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, uh, I still had to tell my two young sons uh, how they had to behave when they drove out with their white friends. Uh, and that when they got pulled over, uh, the police would see them as the most dangerous person in the car, not the three other white boys in the car with them. April, from your vantage point, sitting in, in the briefing room. Uh, where's, your chair, where's your chair now? Third row, smack dab in the middle, and they cannot miss me. <laughs> Although they've tried to move her a couple of times. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> um, from my vantage point, um, starting uh, the second term of Bill Clinton, um, race was a big factor. Bill Clinton, um, Bill Clinton wanted to make America aware that we are a nation that's browning. And he embarked on this great initiative, the race initiative. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, there were some issues that happened along the way um, by the name of Monica, and it kind of sidelined. Um, some of you are old enough to remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, it kind of sidelined that, that initiative. 
But along the way, in these 20 years, I found that race comes into that briefing room, not just because I ask the questions, but because there are crescendo moments. The Trayvon Martins, the Freddie Grays, the Katrinas, um, the Flint water that's not uh, great to drink or good to drink or shouldn't drink it, period. Um, those moments come to the White House. Everything comes to the White House from water peace and everything in between. There was somewhat of a law, um, well, no, I'm not gonna say a law. Clinton, we had issues of race. George Bush, we had issues of race with Katrina. I remember you know, when President Bush traveled to uh, Dr. King's uh, grave site. Remember he received mm -hmm. all those boos? I mean, he was booed, but he still went. Um, I remember the Republican Party did not want to focus a lot on uh, the black community, particularly when it came to issues of Africa. George W. Bush was the president who did more for Africa than any other president at the time. With PEPFAR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He did more for Africa than any other <clears throat> president. And Bill Clinton even said, look, I helped him. I talked to him about these you know, drugs, how to get these drugs and get them uh, lower cost. And, and so we dealt with issues of race. But I remember the, the orchestrators of, of getting the message out, the Carl Roves and everyone along that line were saying, look, you know, black people are not our base. We're just doing this out of our heart. And if they would have given. They're just doing it out of their what? Out of their heart. <laughs> It's a heart issue. Oh, heart. Okay. Out of their heart. What, what, what did you think well, he, I was said? Take, he was taking issue with the, out of their heart, or just cold, cold, crass political calculation because That's they wanted to okay. well, substitute to, for heart. Yeah. Sorry. I was there. So was I. I got you. <laughs> no, but I'm just. But I'm telling you, they did not want to put it into the the atmosphere, particularly for black people. It's like, they're not our base. You know, we're just doing this out of, you know, for heart's sake. That's what they were saying. So then we have the first black president, Barack Hussein Obama, who won on the issue of change. It wasn't just, I don't believe it was just because he was a black man. I believe that after the Bush years, people were looking for something different. They wanted the system to be broken. Um, Michael Steele is, Chairman Steele is absolutely right. We are not, we were not and are not now a post-racial society. Barack Obama's ascendancy to the Oval Office really showed us, it, it put blaring spotlights on all of the ills in the black community because we never thought we'd see this. And then once we had an African-American, well, a black man, yeah, he was African-American, um, or he is African-American, to rise to the highest levels, for him to rise to the highest levels and then not necessarily talk about race, but yet there were issues of race. People were picking that apart. Race came into that mm -hmm. White House in a tremendous way every day. Um, but then I believe the marker after he left, no matter if it was gonna be Hillary Clinton or um, Donald J. Trump, the marker now that this nation sees, we're not post-racial, but I, I believe we are post-Obama. And what does that look like? what we're seeing today. Race is on the table at the White House big time. For the last year and a half, I mean, it's on, it's on the table from issues of the Navajo Code talkers. Okay, can we talk about that for a minute? <laughs> because, okay. I mean, Chairman Steele, could you imagine ever George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, Ronald, Ronald Reagan, Reagan Richard Nixon, and he came up with the Southern strategy, but could you imagine that a president of the United States would hold an event with Navajo code talkers in the Oval Office with a portrait of Andrew Jackson glaring down on them? The backdrop. And that, and I'm even bringing up Pocahontas, because that's like a throwaway line, as horrible and bigoted as it is, okay, but yeah. just the, 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 the tableau that we saw. And what's, to say it wasn't a racial slur. Right. When the, he said Pocahontas. What's happened to, so I, the overall question here, to like div, dive deep down into race and politics, what happened to your party? What, what happened to the Republican Party where that's even acceptable? Well, it's, it's, it's why I drink a lot. Because um, <laughs> I'm still trying to, yeah, I'm still trying to figure it out. Look, it, it, no, to, to your point, those individuals that you mentioned would not have um, 
agreed to staging that uh, um, that way. But Although, let me, I just, I'm just reminded though. Okay. Ronald Reagan did go to Philadelphia, Mississippi after his, mm. after he got the Republican nomination, which was really, really egregious at the time. It was. But this is like, but oh, he didn't wow. go there. As pre he the didn't history. go there as president, and I think that that's right. that's that's the key. But let's the give the history thing. of Philadelphia, Mississippi. Goodwin, Schwerner, and Cheney had just had been right. killed within what ten years. Ten of years that. of that, yeah. So, 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 so we get sixteen years. So we so we get. Look, people use uh, race in politics. They use race as a tool. There's no doubt about that. It happens. Um, it is much more egregious today than it has been as much more overt today uh, than it has been in a long while. So to your point, you're absolutely right. None of those presidents would have done that. Uh, it wouldn't have occurred to them to do that. I, I tell people who sit there and scratch their heads over what they witnessed uh, a couple of weeks ago that this was very deliberate. That was last week. Oh, well, last week, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know. Well, that Time. should tell you everything right there. Uh, but no, it's very deliberate. Uh, and, uh, because, and how do you know it's deliberate? So can you imagine um, one of two scenarios? One, nobody in the White House had a clue that that was what they were doing. No one <laughs> believes that. Two, someone went to, uh, to, to move the picture, and the president was like, what are you doing with the picture? And he's like, well, <laughs> you can't really, got, you know, you've got Native Americans coming, Andrew Jackson, leave it. And what it does is it plays to, it, it's a continual uh, dog whistle. Uh, uh, it's a bullhorn. Son, bull, however you want to call it. But it, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not meant for you. It's not meant for general consumption. Yep. That's the key. All right? It's not meant for you. It is to give comfort, cold comfort, to uh, a very small percentage of his base uh, that uh, rely on this uh, as, as pablum, as what they they feed off of. This is why he's at 33% today, I believe it is, or whatever. Um, and he doesn't care because he knows that he can shift the narrative, change the discussion, or do a psych gag, and, and his folks will be right there uh, yeah. in place with him. He doesn't care that our network you know, at, at MSNBC or CNN or anybody else in the media is alarmed. He doesn't care that rank and file American citizens are, are alarmed by this or concerned by it. If he feeds off of it, I call it, it's, it's sort of his sadistic way of, of uh, messing with us. Yeah, sadistic basically. Sadistic pleasure. It's, it is, it, in many said. respects. He, he sees <laughs> himself that. as <laughs> sort of playing out these narratives in his head. And that's why I keep telling people, stop following the bright, shining object down the rabbit hole. Because that's hard. exactly what I was going to say, April, be. that's hard. You can't, he, he's president hard. of the United States. April, there's no way you could possibly ignore a tweet, a statement, nope. errant Kefefe. comment of the president Kefefe. of the United that's all States. Kefefe. 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 You cannot ignore. <laughs> I mean, it's like, well, what did he mean? Well, a small group of people knew. Well, what? You know what in the world? But no. But here's the thing. Let me let me let's let, let me give another example, a recent example. Let's and just follow me. So remember. Uh oh. <laughs> I know. I know. Just hold on. Settle so, in. So remember, remember. You know all this Confederate stuff. You know. Remember Charlottesville. Let's fast forward to Alabama when the president went to Alabama to support Strange. Correct. Luther Strange. Yes. But Bannon supported Roy Moore. Remember. So anyway. So he's in Alabama. Now, all of this is going on. He couldn't get it right. And I'm following the shiny ball on this because Charlottesville was huge. Charlottesville was one of these markers See, for this president. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on. He couldn't get it right. See, that's where you're wrong. No, 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 no. He couldn't get it right. And you even had, you even had um, How David do you mean Duke he coming. What do you mean he, he could couldn't not, get it right? He could not figure out his message. No, see, that's where you're wrong. That's he, where you're fundamentally wrong. When the teleprompters wrong. were up, the nation was like, oh, good, this is great. That's where you're fundamentally but when wrong, he, But wait a minute. But when he was by himself speaking extemporaneously, the world was upside down. And David Duke was like, I like that message. He couldn't get it right. He took about six or seven times to try to figure. He kept talking. But wait, he still on. didn't get it right. But wait a minute. April? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you how this bothered him. So he understood Charlottesville was a call for certain members of that small thirty-three percent that support him. Now, and this is from someone who watches as you do. Okay. 
He, when he went to Alabama, he said, what can I do to pull them in? He knew Charlottesville was not gonna work because he was so, he was vacillating back and forth on it. So he had to come out with something else. So what he did was, he spoke all this other stuff, but he said, okay, here's what's on the board. Let me take Charlottesville out and add in the NFL taking a knee, which he changed the narrative on. And people in Alabama loved it because that was the time. The, the taking the knee was going on when President yeah. Obama was still president. And it was, it was not about, it was not about the flag. It, it was never not was. about, right, and it was it not was. about the soldiers. It never was. It was about police involved shootings. Right. But here's and, what, but, but, but here's, wait a minute, but, but the, no, 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 the, no, no, the president with his go, narrative in that bully pulpit changed the narrative. Uh, yeah, but, I, they, but they, I say that's the same narrative. That's what you need to understand. <laughs> right. Charlottesville is not separate from the NFL. Charlottesville is the other side of the NFL. It is a different, it is the same coin, just flipped differently. But, but he you substituted, but he, you have he strategically the same. took out, when he went to Alabama, yes, but it's, Charlottesville, which still had momentum. It doesn't momentum. matter, you put the coin in the machine, you're still gonna get something out. No, 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 out. no, Charlottesville was flawed because he was vacillating. No, see, this now, is where, this I, well, I'm gonna be the referee. No, but, no, can I just <laughs> make this point real quick? <laughs> yeah. This is where I think, with all due respect, people in the media get Donald Trump wrong. They think that he gets it wrong, that he's trying to figure it out. Donald Trump, let's go back to that Charlottesville. The first speech that Donald Trump gave on Charlottesville was what? It was a teleprompter speech, mm -hmm. right. right? That was not how Donald Trump felt. I know for a fact Donald Trump didn't want to give that speech. We know, we know. So, so it wasn't a question of his getting it wrong. Maybe the people around him got it wrong. Let me say hey, this. Let me finish my, okay, let me finish okay, my narrative. So <laughs> he does that on Saturday. He says, okay, I'll do, your sp I'll, do it, I'll do it differently the next time. That's what I'm talking All right? about. So the next time, he gave a little bit, he gave a little bit more of what his thinking is. Right. All right? Because it was what he wanted to say. It was not what he wanted to say the right. first time. We're in all agreement. Right? right. So all I'm saying is it's the same coin. He just uses it a little bit differently. But he didn't get and it right. He was one day this way, the other no, day so that way. No, you're getting it wrong. No, okay, no, so I'm, I, the referee's jumping in yeah, here. Yeah, jump in. You are both, you, you are both right. But I think what what what, <laughs> what but what Michael Steele, what Michael Steele but 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 Michael Steele is making the extra point that it's not a matter of, of President Trump getting it right or getting right. it wrong. Right. The president, whether he's talking about Charlottesville or talking about NFL players taking the knee, it is all, all food the, for the same the group same of people. The forgotten man. It's all the same the for him. The forgotten man. And so it's just a matter on which day does he pull that off the shelf and use it. Donald Trump could just as easily go back to Charlottesville tomorrow as he could the NFL if something else doesn't come along. It depends on what in that moment he needs to take us off of Robert Mueller to take us off of whatever he has a problem with. Right. And that's the bright, shining object. So it's not a question of Donald Trump getting it wrong. Whenever Donald Trump gives a teleprompter speech, know that, this. That's not him. That's not him. <laughs> he is we not, know that. He's not right. telling you, he's not saying what he believes, he's not saying uh, what he feels, he's telling you what they have written for him and what he wants to say. When he stands, when he goes to Missouri, and he's standing in front of all those folks, and he starts to go on a riff, or he, in, in that moment, with, in the Oval Office, I mean, in, in, yeah, with the, yeah, with the picture of Andrew J Jackson behind him, and he, you, saw the, you saw him, you saw the moment where he's talking to these code, these code guys, what do they call code them? Code talkers. Code talkers, right? He's talking to them, he's telling them, and he goes, yeah, um, yeah, like we, got, we, got, we, got, uh, we got one in the Senate. Yeah. And you can see the wheels turning. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to drop this right here. <laughs> right. Because he knows. And that's the unfortunate part, is that everyone's going to run with that instead of saying, like you would, a parent would to a child, time out. Okay, I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors, but at the same time, Mueller is in the forefront. Mueller's going to continue. At least yeah. he's focused. He's going to continue. The games are being played, but at the same time, while Mueller's doing that thing, he is dropping the shiny balls. But as he's dropping those shiny balls, you're telling us not to pay attention to it and do Mueller. We can do both, but when he's dropping that shiny ball, he's causing problems. There is a tension in this nation that is bubbling up because of this racial animus that he has. Yeah. 
There is, and you cannot ignore it. It is bubbling up. You, you're hearing about people in Virginia sending letters, uh, these white supremacists. People are getting these letters on their doors and on their cars about rallies and, and negative, nasty things. It's a real problem. And there are people in this nation who are still stuck in that period of time where they feel like others are the other is getting something that they should have. And when you feel that way, and when and you feel that I'm underemployed or unemployed, and they're getting it, there's anger that keeps perpetuating. And he is helping to stir the pot. So April, let me ask you, let me ask you this. Um, and you can't miss that. You gotta look at that ball too. So, well, let's look at you as a shiny ball. Oh Lord. Well, that's, um, as, I'm shiny, I'm, I'm glad bleeding. you brought it. <laughs> right, third row, so you said you are third row center in the White House press briefing every day and with Sean Spicer, I who you had known me. for a long time. And so it was no surprise to me that he would call on you in the briefing. But then suddenly you became this lightning rod. You became, not that you even tried, I did. but the, the most famous moment, and I'm sure everyone here knows that moment. Wait a minute, which one? I know, but it, this is... I mean, I said, I'm like, here's a couple of them now. <laughs> well, I said, that's why I call this one the most famous Which one? moment. This is the one where you were asking him a question, and you Which shook one? Sean your head. Which one, Sean the president? Oh, Sean. Sean, and you, uh, you, you shook your head, and he said, don't, don't stop shaking your head, April. How dare you? So, if he's, playing, <laughs> if he's playing to the base in Charlottesville, and he's playing to the base with the NFL and taking the knee, do you think that the people at that podium, and the way Sarah Huckabee Sanders treats you, is equally condescending? Thank you. Do it grown more. I hear it. <laughs> so, do you, so, so do you think that Sean and now Sarah, through acting on behalf of the president, are, were and are talking to the president's base huh. by using you as a foil? Using me as a foil, you said yes, okay. <laughs> um, using me as a foil, well, first of so all, they're stand well, we're standing up to her. I will never be used as a foil, let's start that off. Um, I am a serious journalist for 20 years. Thank you, I've been in that White House briefing room for 20 years. You may think the questions are crazy, I don't care, but those questions are, are real and they're not contrived, I'm not playing to a room. The problem is they're, they are playing to an audience of one, the president, when they go back at the end of the day, and you know this, mm -hmm. he chastises them for mm -hmm. how they have Conduct their conducted their, yeah, conducted themselves. And he does not like me, and they don't like me. And I don't know why he doesn't like me. And I, it's not, I don't care. I respect him. I respect the office. I love this country. And I'm going to continue to ask questions. But here's the problem. When you go on Twitter, you see the Twitter trolls. The Twitter trolls are like, oh, why isn't she, why haven't you revoked her press pass? For what? What have I done? I have asked questions like everyone else in that room. So let me say this to you. If you talk about the Confederacy and how much Robert E. Lee was great and, and, and support what General Kelly says, and you leave us more questions and answers, yeah, I'm going to ask, do you think slavery is wrong? I'm going to ask it, and I'm going to ask about Charlottesville, but I'm also going to ask about Russia. That's when Sean got mad and said something about Russian salad dressing and stop shaking your head. <laughs> you know, I'm going to ask about North Korea when she said, so what did she say that day? She got I don't snarky. remember. I don't even remember. It's so many things. I'm like, okay, what? I raised my hand one day and said, well, that's Sarah. that's your first mistake. Yeah, <laughs> oh, you think I should scream? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I raised my hand and I said, Sarah, oh, you asked it so politely. Like, what was I supposed to do? And I'm going to say this to you, and I, in all honesty, <sighs> this is not a joke. It's not a joke. And I say it's not a joke because this is real. When they say enemy, Enemy of the people. Of the people, and Steve Bannon was calling us opposition party, and Sarah over some dumb pie on Twitter. You know, y'all know what it is. Because you have the temerity to ask, wait, 
Show us the uh, pie. Uh, uh, yes. Pictures of you making the pie. We all show our pictures on Twitter, right? And on social media. I was just saying this as a joke and it wound up, she got all upset and offended because the Photoshop pie or the shop photo stock pie didn't look real. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, so whatever. Who cares? It's a pie. But that pie is actually a symbol of the real issue about go. truth. But here's what I'm going to say to you. This has been going on long before the shaking your head stuff. And in August, it came to a head. This is real. In August, I received the NABJ Journalist of the Year Award that Saturday in New Orleans. That Sunday, I had a lot of my friends email me, have you seen the Trump ad? I said, what are you talking about? Have you seen the ad? My kids are with me in New Orleans. And I look, and I'm, I go into the fetal position. There's a campaign ad with many of our friends who are in this campaign ad that's approved by the president. He says, I approve this message. Don Lemon, Anderson Cooper, Rachel Maddow, Chris Matthews, Wolf Blitzer, a lot of people. Talk show hosts. 23 seconds in, I see a familiar face. It's me, the only White House correspondent that is considered an enemy or someone who will thwart the administration. I'm the only White House correspondent. And at that moment, he put a target on my head. We are living in a dangerous time where there are people who want to act out what this man is saying. And this mm -hmm. is why I'm saying, you know, you talk about the shiny object. Sometimes you got to stop and pay oh, attention yeah. to the shiny object. But I'm just saying, guys, this is real. This is real. And not to, not to um, reveal too much, but I mean, it, this is very real for you personally. Yes. Uh, and how you how your life has changed yes. since before since before the pie thing. Um, and sort of the, the I've messages death and threats. things I've that gotten you've gotten. Death gotten. Threats. So and I've got kids. But I'm from Baltimore. Don't come for me. <laughs> <laughs> don't come for me. Right. You were my lieutenant uh, governor. I know. I yes. Know. That's why we got two Maryland folks Trust here. <laughs> All right. So we need to talk about the, the, the impact that race in general is having on, on, our, on our politics and how because the president plays to the base, he, he's jangling the shiny object in front, of, in front of that tiny portion of the 33% that, who support him, but that tiny portion of the 33% has 400, no, 535 people on Capitol Hill living in fear. <laughs> well, not all 535, but the Republican majorities are living in fear because the dog whistles and things have riled up the Republican Party base to the point where the state of Alabama, <laughs> you know, let's just leave out Alabama, because- No, bring I mean, it in, bring no, it no, in. No, 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 well, I mean, just, it's I'm going to leave the out the people. Of, I'm going to leave out the people of Alabama and talking about more about the party. That the Republican Party is walking in the leadership, walking pretty much in lockstep now. Oh, let the people of Alabama decide whether Roy Moore, an accused child molester, should be the next senator from the state of Alabama. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan, uh, at least Mitch McConnell, said he should step aside and not run. That was two weeks ago. Hmm. Now, he says, the people, the people of Alabama, Alabama should decide. decide. And why is that? Because they, as Kellyanne Conway said on television last week, we need the vote. But she even changed her tune, too. Because she was, she was not well, she's, in support. Well, she was almost, well, well, not in support, but then she's maybe in legal jeopardy for doing what she did. But anyway. But because they are living in fear of this base that is responding to the racial bullhorns from the president, that they are willing to turn a blind eye to a man who is accused of being a serial child molester to the point where he was banned from the local mall. So if Roy Moore <laughs> gets elected, and Michael, I'm going to ask, Chairman Steele, I'm going to ask you to basically repeat what you said on Deadline White House today with Nicole Wallace. If Roy Moore gets elected, he goes to Washington, mm -hmm. will Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell have, have the cojones to, to 
start the process to remove Roy Moore or to send his case to the Ethics Committee? Will he be they removed? Will, they will, no, he will not. Um, they will um, begin a process of looking at, um, through the Ethics Committee, uh, allegations uh, about the senator that occurred before he became a senator. Um, you see where I'm going with mm -hmm. that, right? Okay. Uh, so the bottom line is no, they won't. Uh, the president today endorsed uh, Roy Moore because, as the president noted, uh, he needed the vote. We need the vote. Uh, and from my perspective, uh, that's just bullshit. And the, right now, right now, what it says. But, but why? Why? Why because, is that bullshit? Basically, because the president has abdicated any moral, uh, any moral authority. Not that he had any to begin with, but any moral uh, authority he had um, to to speak on these types of issues in the future. Number one. Number two, the party has capitulated because it is so caught up in beating Democrats. Which, trust me, as a former county and state and national. Republican chairman, I like to do that from time to time. <laughs> um, but there's always a time and place uh, where those things uh, you know, are the order of the day. It's generally an election. But when you're beyond that, you're now governing. You have the House, you have the Senate, you have the White House. Uh, now is the time to take responsibility and govern. So we have abdicated that responsibility um, because everyone, and I'm so sick of it, it makes me pull out my hair, which should tell you exactly <laughs> where I am. I'm so sick of talking to members who go, yeah, I don't know what we're going to do about this president. I said, I have a few ideas I can share with you. But they, you know, quietly, you've heard it. You both have heard it. You've talked to them quietly, privately. They're, they're, they're aghast. They're appalled. And, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Um, but then, like today, the majority leader comes out and he goes, well, we just leave it to the people of Alabama. So the fact of the matter is Roy Moore will likely win on the 12th of this month. Roy Moore will likely will be seated in the United States Senate, and you will not hear another peep out of Republicans who will avoid uh, folks like my colleagues here uh, who won't want to answer questions about why that happened. And this is my bottom line. But they'll line. have people tweet about you on Twitter. Well, this is my bottom line. Uh, <clears throat> they do that uh, at their own peril. They have, you talk about that base that's been riled up within the GOP. Well, a much sig more significant and larger base has been riled up across the country, and it's American women, who will not uh, forget uh, where the Republican Party was when it came to Roy Moore in Alabama, nor should they. Um, and, well, and I, I think... I want to challenge you on that. White women because, because I, I, after last November's election, everything that I thought I knew and believed right. about American politics was completely blown up. Yeah, true. And we have a man who ran for president of the United States. Yeah. The tape comes out of him saying that when you're famous, they let you do that. Right. You know, you can grab him by the meow meow. meow. Right. And, you know, <laughs> oh, my goodness. I can't say the word, but you know what I mean. And use a Tic Tac when you're doing right, it. Right, right. And yet, and despite, <laughs> des what? despite what the evidence. You didn't, he said Tic uh, Tac. Pop a Tic Tac. You Pop just start killing them because you can't help it. I mean, really. But he's on tape. He's okay, on tape. So, so wait, let me finish. He's on tape okay. saying it. The he then meow. does like the hostage video right. from Trump Tower saying, those are my words and I'm sorry. And yet he was hostage. elected president of the United States and he won white women yeah, against did. a white woman. He did. So what so, makes you think uh, that I'll women, because if Roy Moore is elected, women are going to suddenly abandon Republicans? Okay, there, there are a number of, of reasons for what I say. Um, let's start with um, what happened uh, in um, Virginia. Uh, That's of, Virginia. Of, no, it's not That's Virginia. Right. It's okay. not just Virginia. You've got to look at Virginia and understand what took place in Virginia. And Virginia is, by all accounts, a purple state. Uh, it trends blue on occasion. It trends red on occasion. Uh, but it is, by and large, a purple state. Within Virginia, you have population sectors that centers that you need to pay attention to that will give you a fingerprint, a blueprint of where the country is because in many respects it's a, it's a little bit of a microcosm. So Loudoun County, Virginia, which we're all familiar with in the, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., um, was uh, significant. Why was it significant? Because 
Uh, in 2000, um, let's see, I guess the last election, Obama won, that ele won Loudoun County. Uh, and then you go in the interim, I look at the gubernatorial election, the mm -hmm. senatorial election that Ed Gillespie ran. Ed Gillespie won Loudoun County when he ran for the U U.S. Senate, all right? Running for governor and looking at this cycle, Ed Gillespie lost Loudoun County. Loudoun County tends to be a fairly conservative county in Northern Virginia. In fact, it is probably the most conservative county in, in Northern hmm. Virginia. He lost it significantly. And why he lost it goes to what happened in the rest of the state. So you're sitting here, you're talking about women. All right, what does it mean? What happened after the election, uh, after the inauguration uh, earlier this year? Women organized on the mall and everyone poo pooed it. Oh, that's so nice, that's cute. It's not going to amount to anything, it doesn't mean anything. But what happened across the country, if you paid attention and you kept your finger on the pulse, what happened was they organized, they galvanized, they identified, and they ran candidates. And they're running these candidates now. Of the 16 seats that were part of the Democratic win in Virginia that helped them flip that le state legislature in the House, which potentially we've got a couple of races that are still... I was going to say, did they actually flip it? No, they, they're right, they're right on the bubble. They're right on the close. 13 of those 16 seats were run by women. One of them was won by a transgendered woman who ran against a man who proudly stated that he was homophobic, that he wanted nothing to do with gay people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He ran against her gender. She ran about transportation. All right? So <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Like she, she, talked, she talked about transportation. roads. She talked about, you know. Traffic. Traffic. Yep. He was running against a transgendered female, and she kicked his ass. And she did so, she did so because you pull back and look at where those same white women were, they were in a very different space in that election than they were early, a year ago. Here's hmm. the first, the, the actual second point. You have to understand, and I know a lot of people hate hearing this, and they really, they can't get their head around it, but the proof is in the evidence, in the, in the reporting, and so forth. Donald, it wasn't so much that Donald Trump won, it's that Hillary Clinton lost. That I agree with you. All right? And women, I don't care how you cut and slice this bad boy, were not about, despite everything else, is how she won white, well, how she lost, you, then you tell me how she lost white educated women. After everything else, at the end of the day, when you had two very unpopular figures all right, to choose from, Trump was the better choice no. Of those, of those two. No, 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 no. She was the most qualified. Now, See, not this is not about. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me say this. Let me say this. Let me say this. To do with her I am not supporting Hillary at all, but I'm just going to say, at a time when we're dealing with craziness overseas, she's the one. She's had legislative. Who's sitting in the White House? I understand, but I'm and saying you're talking get, about and he how was did the most he get she, there? Wasn't she was qualified. I did not. Did you hear me say she wasn't qualified? You basically no, said I she did was, not. Yes, she did. I did. Anyway, no, moving no, on. No, 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 no. I'm not going to let you put words. I'm not going to let you put words in my <laughs> mouth. So let me be clear. Be let clear. me be clear. Be, of the be two clear. candidates, she was clearly the most qualified. Okay. But she was not with those same white educated women. Won it. But let me and say this. Let me say this to you. Let me, wait, I let, believe let, wait, some of April, this is common sense. Okay, okay, let, let me finish the okay, point okay. and then... See, you just can't take it in abstract. You just can't look it on the surface and call it something. No, to, no, 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 no. Then no. please, April, go, go, out ahead, to, go, go out into the country and talk to those women and they will tell you okay. why they didn't vote for Hillary. Well, let me tell you, let me tell they you, let me tell you. They will tell you why. It had nothing to do with Donald Trump and everything to do with her. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why they wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. Why? Listen to me. And she even knows this herself, okay? Now, let's be honest here. How many of you are really ready for a woman to lead? I mean, All this right. is kind of the wrong audience I know, to I know, ask. I, know. I mean, <laughs> come but on. But we still have, wait a minute, we still have this thought in this nation that women cannot lead, okay? Yes. Even among women, yes. white women, when a white woman... That's nothing to do with their qualifications. Also, okay, but wait a minute. I know, I know. That's my but point. But let me say this to you. <laughs> the goalpost has been moved so That's much... Point. The goalpost has been moved so much with this election cycle. When people wanted to go high, he went low. People did not understand. Wait a minute, let he me went finish. where people are. He, well, wait a minute, hold, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish. People were, the people who were running could not have, 
all the Republican candidates couldn't have, she couldn't have. They were not used to the gutter tactics that he played. And people like this entertainment. This, this whole yeah. thing about this entertainment thing played into the psyche of people. And then, okay. when he okay. kept slapping her, crooked Hillary, crooked Hillary, okay. everything that he called her, what's going on now? He kept saying crooked Hillary, and it stuck. She did not fight back. And once someone doesn't fight back, they look wounded. And that, a lot of this was psyche. It wasn't all about, oh, well, I think he's the better candidate. No, I never said that. No. I never said that he was the better candidate. I don't think he was. Clearly, he wasn't the better candidate. What I'm saying is people had to draw I'll a be line quiet. between two <laughs> candidates they didn't like. You're absolutely right. right. People didn't I've want talk, a dynasty I've either. Talk, talk, they did not want Bill Clinton back in the I, White House. I don't know if that, how much that had to do with it as, as anything else, but I do know, to the point that you made, having talked to, with Democratic operatives, all right, at the time, I went back to the 2008 election because I wanted to understand why Hillary Clinton didn't people win didn't in 2008. And you know what they told me? You know exactly what they told me? Right. If given the choice between a black man and a woman, we'll take the black man every day. All right, so that's what Democratic operatives told me about the 2008 election. So to your voter, point, voter apathy your, and, and the point, Democrat for those voting point, for her was much less. Am but I to correct? your point, it, but yes, but to yeah, okay, your point. Okay, but see, but, there are a lot of reasons why she didn't win. So well, actually, me, he's so agreeing tell, with you. I'm he's agreeing trying, with he's trying you. To say to, he said to your point like three times. Go ahead, go ahead. I was agreeing with you. I'm just saying that. So then, then explain to me if it's all of that. What? Where were black folks? Black folks did not have Obama on the on the ticket. It's more she than was that. not. Wait a minute, hold on. It is more than that. Black folks want to say. Let me tell you the reason why Obama won and why Donald Trump won. Change. She yeah. did not represent. She did not come out of the box. We are now looking for someone who's charismatic, who can. We're still looking for that rock star almost. Yeah. It is unfortunate she did not have that star ability. Okay, but black folks did not feel, even as she took along with her the mothers of the movement, the Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon's mother, all of these things. That she was. She even brought to the forefront Flint, Michigan. Yeah. Black people didn't feel. It. I'm gonna tell you this. I was at the last um, Congressional Black Caucus dinner last year, and I'll never forget, not this one, but the one, the one when they were running. And she was there and she spoke. The, cloud, the crowd was very tepid. They were like, oh, okay. I had congressional leaders running to me saying, April, I'm not feeling it. Give me some hope. I said, I don't know what to tell you. I said, you guys have got to go out there and fight. Well, and that's Michael, when I knew that she yeah. would not win. Michael, so that October. Um, the... Was it the first episode of my podcast where you were my debut guest, mm -hmm. or was it after the election where I asked you, why didn't African American voters go for Hillary Clinton despite President Obama saying, this my girl, but despite her being married to Bill Clinton, who was the president. first black president, and you had a very good analysis for why the aura and the aura and mystique of, of Bill Clinton and Barack Obama did not transfer yeah, itself yeah. to Hillary Clinton, and why is that? Well, it's because for 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 black folks, there was there was there was not this personal thing with her. With Bill, it was personal. With Bill, it was it was something that was readily identifiable, innate. It, it was, was like innate. this very inherent. It was connection. very inherent. Um, Obama was not just, the, obviously, he's a black guy, but it was also the sort of innate connection that they had, to your point. And again, I'm not disagreeing with where, you're, where you are. I'm just, I'm just saying <laughs> we're just coming at it a little differently. Um, and, and I think for Hillary, the problem was her expectation was that what Bill had, she would get. Mm -mm. And it didn't work like that. It doesn't transfer like it that. It didn't transfer. And I think what she thought that what Obama had, she would get. I would say it just as a side note, I don't think Obama really wanted to give her all of it anyway, but <laughs> I'll set that aside for another discussion. Well, you you had, you they should have campaigned for her earlier and harder. They should have. But, he, but, but here's the thing, Michael. The, the way you said it was, it, it, you described it as a friend. So yeah. let's say April's, April's Hillary Clinton, you're Barack Obama, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm supposed to, right. like, you're trying to convince me to vote for her, but you said something like, but that's your friend. Yeah, that's and right. That, and that was and the problem. The that's like, the problem. I love you, right. but I have nothing right. yeah. to do with her. So, and so the voters look at that when you, and again, you know, I, I've said for a number of years, um, 
I have a, an enormous amount of respect for uh, Hillary and what she's accomplished and all of that. But as from a political perspective, Hillary was not a political animal. She was not an innate political animal. So her mm -hmm. expectations were that she would either get cover by those who had those political instincts like her husband and the president, um, or she would have people around her who would help translate a lot of that for her, like a David Axelrod type, mm -hmm. who that person didn't exist in her campaign. So the expectation going into these relationships with African Americans, with white women, and so forth, was, I'm your friend. And they were like, no, you ain't. <laughs> she had the heart. She had the heart. She didn't have the policy. But it didn't matter. No, she yeah. had the policy. She, she had the have policy, that. but, but the, it didn't well, matter. She, that's not but the to your policy, point, right? No, that's, right. That's where people, people weren't there, April. But she didn't have... When it came time to talk about black issues, we didn't really hear it as resoundingly on the policy front as... I mean, she talked about it, but it wasn't... She had the heart for it, but she couldn't translate it. Oh, well, this is... I'll, I'll disagree with you on that, because no. I think I think one of the... the leg Black people didn't show up for her. Well, they and didn't... that's saying it didn't translate. The communication just didn't translate. Okay. In, the, in that case, sure. I would just, I would just say um, one of the enduring legacies of Hillary's campaign is how was her fearlessness in talking about race. Right. She gave three speeches detailed, nuanced speeches on race um, that got no attention because Mr. Shiny Object was dropping all the shiny, shiny objects, objects and taking right. all the oxygen out of the room. But Hillary Clinton had, she had, she has it. She's got the it, but she couldn't put the I and the T together. Right. And the prop, no, no, seriously. <laughs> it, and, she, it, and she readily admits that in her book, in yeah. What Happens, yeah, she, she talks about how she couldn't make that connection. You've interviewed her, yes. I've interviewed her. But the her. thing of it is, when you walk, I mean, when you walk with the mothers of the movement, when you have Eric Garner's mother with you on stage, it doesn't translate and resonate. I mean, she's walking with, we've got the mothers of the movement. People are like, who? And it's the whole, uh, for over a year. And it, what are the policies that you're going to put in place? I'm asking, you know, uh, and, it didn't, and this did not resonate throughout the nation. I said, okay, so remember the time uh, when the president, President Obama, then President Obama, was actually nominating his last Supreme Court justice? Remember that? Mm -hmm. And people were like, oh, it's going to be a black woman. Oh, it's going to be finally be a black woman. And it wasn't a black woman. And it wound up, I asked her on the road, I believe it was in Baltimore when I saw her, I said, would you actually do that, you know, would you actually uh, appoint or, 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 or nominate a, a, a black woman as a Supreme Court justice? She didn't want to talk about it, but her people came back and told me, yes, she's really considering that. Why not say that, you know? I mean, I'm just, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny, but those mm -hmm. kind of things would have helped to carry the ball forward for her. That would have sent, that would have been a, a lightning yes. bolt of a message. Instead yeah, of your people, here's, here's, but her, right. you know. Here's her problem. She was trying to tri triangulate two very disparate uh, interest groups. One was the very group you're talking about who would be animated by uh, a black female Supreme Court nominee and Bubba, everybody else who would not be. And, and so you saw that play out with the coal miners, where she mm -hmm. spoke uh, about, well, her policy, what she thought about coal miners, and when the coal miners went, oh, really? Okay, uh-huh, let's see if you get West Virginia, which she wasn't gonna get anyway. Mm -hmm. right. but, it, but then she had to play catch up. Then she felt she had to sit down with the coal miners and talk to them, which only made it worse. And so, so she suffered from, I think, one of those things that some politicians do. We saw this with, um, with my friend Ed Gillespie in Virginia. Just be who you are. Don't let others come in and dictate your terms. Is he for still you. your friend given the campaign he ran? Yeah, I mean, it's a per yeah, no, we've had this conversation, trust me. Oh, um, what'd he say? Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah. take some notes. Yeah, I know you will. I know you will. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I've always advised candidates if you cannot be authentically you, then don't do this. That's true. Because there will come a moment in your campaign where you're going to be caught between you and the authentic you. And that's not a space you want to be in. You want to be consistent at all times, no matter what. Uh, I learned that lesson from my very first race in Maryland uh, back in 1998 uh, to my last race and to certainly my time at the RNC, is that that's what people want to see, which is, again, was Hillary's one of her shortcomings because people never saw her or didn't think of her as authentic about certain things. That was one. 
Donald Trump, ironically and painfully enough, people saw as authentic. Why? We because are seeing he, the real him because now, because yes. You see, because he would get out there, and he was sounding like people sitting around in bars and, the bar, exactly. right. and, and talking, and talking back, yeah, I wish they would, I smack the hell out of them if they come up in here doing that. You're absolutely That's right. That's what people say. That's how people are talking. I remember the focus group, and I'm sure you do too, <clears> both <throat> of you, New Hampshire, white female mother oh, yes. of two, oh, yeah. right? When asked about Donald Trump, why do you support Donald Trump? You know what the response was? Because he's just like me. No, he's not. Yep, I'll never, for I'll never forget us. that. So if you don't take the time and step back and go, now why would this white woman, <laughs> mother of two in New Hampshire, think that this bully billionaire from New York is just like her? Who's intelligent and been to and Ivy if, League schools. Right, and if you, yeah. if you don't want to get behind that and understand that you will miss what happened in 2016. So I'm going to ask a, a, a last question of you before opening it up to the audience for questions. And I just want to tell you, I'm going to be, do my flight attendant thing here. There are microphones on either side of the <laughs> either aisle, standing mics. You've practiced um, that. I urge you to have a question. Make sure that it is a short question. If it is not a short question, I will be forced to cut you off. And please, for the love of God, no statements. Um, if you do go into a speech, I don't mean to be rude, but I will, I will have to cut you off, and I will be rude about it. So <laughs> please, line up at the, at the microphones. We'll try to take in as many questions as we can. So that's why I'm asking for questions to be brief. Um, oh, they're and we'll, up. We, will, we will alternate. Ooh, lining up. Wow, I thought, I thought that, like, folks would like, clear the aisles and be coming up to the end, but we got a lot of people, so we will start over here. Hi, my name is Amber. I'm a professor here hey, in Amber. the School of Professional Studies, and um, I was playing with this notion or thinking of this idea about citizen journalism uh -huh. in a time when um, so much of who we are, what we think, and what we believe is related to social media. So I wanted to know what each of you all thought about this concept and how we might be able to incorporate it in our daily lives. Thanks, Amber. Yeah. And of course, I forgot to ask my own question, but I'll save it. Do you want to jump in on citizen journalism? And um, I think it's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, citizen journalism is great if it's used responsibly. Um, We've got a lot of new citizen journalists coming to the White House. <laughs> <laughs> new I'm serious. New there bloggers. You In, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Newsmax and Breitbart. We got, and well, well, we've got a, no. Well, I'm not saying I'm not calling out any names, but um, we've got I a lot of people did. who just set up blogs and are saying they're journalists and coming. It is a, a big job that needs to have a lot of um, maturity and responsibility. Because when you say something and you put it out in the atmosphere, that's it. You can't take it back. The internet is about information. It's not about taking it back, extracting. It is out there and the tentacles go deep. Mm -hmm. When pe people say things or video something, the, 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 everything behind and around needs to support it accurately. Um, I just, mm -hmm. whoever is a, a citizen, we are all citizen journalists now, because these new devices, <clears throat> when was it, 2007 they came out? Mm -hmm. Smartphones, these are some of the best devices ever, but they're also dangerous, because I can take a picture and say something that's so not true and do something, do some kind of harm to people, but then I, I also can take a picture of something that happens. I think about Eric Garner. I can't breathe 11 times mm -hmm. here in New York. And all those videos showed the accountability, accountability piece of this. And now we're still waiting to find out what's happening with the officers. His mother, Gwen Carr, is still mm -hmm. looking for justice. I believe this is one of the greatest tools being a citizen journalist, but I think responsibility and accuracy is still the key, no matter what. I hope I answered your question. Right, and I, and I, I agree with that, that especially now when everyone you have as much access to information mm -hmm. that April and I do as mm -hmm. journalists, Amber, um, and everyone in, in the audience. But now, because of the age that we're in, that when you're reading, when you're disseminating information, you have to do it with such care. Mm -hmm. People seem to think that April and I, in the stories that she, she does and she reports on the radio or that I write as an opinion writer, that we just 
come out and rewrite it. And mm -mm. no, there is reporting, there is fact checking, there is finding hyperlinks so you could do more of your own research. Mm -hmm. There is vetting all sorts of things. By the time that product we call comes him out, sometimes. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't going to give up any of my sources. <laughs> but um, but we do so much that by the time it goes out, if everything has worked out well, mm -hmm. we've jumped through so many hoops that I think citizen journalists don't they don't Understand. clear all of them if they clear any of them at all question here yes hi uh, my name is Frank Lewis and I've been teaching statistics here at NYU for the last uh, 23 years um, my name? question uh, uh, is posed to anybody on the panel and basically it's something that I haven't really been able to figure out and here it is um, why why is it that just about everybody that Trump is associated with uh, ends up, uh, pardon my friends, looking like an ass, okay? Uh, mm. Including those that will come from the highest level of career, dignified careers, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, he almost seems to have the reverse Midas touch. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, um, Chairman Steele, would you like to explain why <laughs> things happen to people? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, Donald Trump demands uh, a high degree of loyalty to him. It is a, a uh, one-way street. And the expectation is that at any moment in time, um, that when uh, he needs you to be of service for whatever reason, for whatever thing, you will be there. And I think there is this sense that people have of wanting not to disappoint him. Mm -hmm. I can't figure that out. But that is a very real part of this. And you see it. And there's the Lewandowski uh, book that's coming out in which they talk about how you know, he would berate these people and you know, put the fear in the, most, you know, the strongest of men, but you know, then you just look forward to going back to work the next day. I'm oh. like, you've got an issue. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the environment you want to be in. But you can only be in that environment if you fulfill that particular psychological need that he has for wanting to be successful, then you talk, I mean, not su successful, him being successful. You talk about the Secretary of State, Ms. Tillerson. Mm -hmm. Ms. Tillerson wants to get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> the President wants him to go too, but he's not going anywhere until a year. Yes, oh yeah, and explain why, because it has nothing to do with service to the country. It has nothing to do with service to the country or service to the man. It has everything to do with the fact that when he left uh, ExxonMobil, um, oh, yeah. he had to liquidate all of his holdings, all right? We talk at Buku Cash, <laughs> which, uh, given the provision of law that says if you do that to come into the administration, it's tax-free. If you leave the administration before one year of service, you pay taxes. <laughs> right? Look at, the, look at the response. This is, this is, this is subchapter A of draining the swamp, <laughs> right? So, but and all of that plays into this whole loyalty piece. And, and the other side of that particular coin is Trump doesn't want any, he's got enough things he's got to deal with in terms of all the other fires that are sort of beginning to burn up around his camp in terms of Flynn, his own son, uh, his son-in-law, et cetera, to now go out there and have the Secretary of State um, free to say what he wants to say mm -hmm. about the past year. Thanks, but it's Professor Lewis. Wait, what, what's your, you have a question for who? Chairman Steele or yes, Professor Yes, I have Lewis? a question oh. for you, Chairman Steele. What's that? So, loyalty. Yeah. Did the president actually tweet that, or did his lawyer fall on the sword for him? The tweet yesterday saying that um, Michael Flynn lied, right. uh, lied to him and the FBI, and that's mm -hmm. why he fired him. By the way, that was my impetus for the question. Yeah, well, well. Uh, We're the great the, minds the think alike. The, <laughs> the fact, fact of the matter is, if his lawyer tweeted it, it was at the instruction of the president. But he could be disbarred for that. Well, that's a risk he was willing to take now, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he's getting that monthly check. Question mm -hmm. here. Thank you for a great conversation. My name is Craig Mills. I am an alum here, but I also teach 
here as well. My question, I forget if it was Jonathan or Michael who listed the Republican presidents in the past who wouldn't have uttered the things Donald. that Donald Trump does, but Republicans still had these policies that were to decimate people of color. So what is the difference between what Donald Trump is saying and what the Republicans have been doing for the past 50 plus years? Well, that's an, that is an excellent question. And Reagan said welfare queens. Right, right. Reagan oh, said there, welfare queens, There yeah. are no clean hands in any of this. I think the point I was trying to make was that there was, for lack of a better word, a certain convention, um, a certain mores, certain customs, and that a president of the United States would never in a million years mm -hmm. do or say some of the things as the leader of the country um, in a public setting that Donald Trump has done. That's not to say that there weren't, that's why I remember once I said that, I, do, I backtracked and said, well, we did have Ronald Reagan go to Philadelphia, Mississippi after he, was, after he won the nomination, but as Chairman Steele said, he wasn't president yet. But that's not to say that they haven't done policies that have certainly hurt um, African Americans and people of color. It's more that the, the, the curtain has been just torn down. There is no <laughs> separation between private setting and public setting. With There's no hide in the dirt now. Right. President Trump has flung open the door and there's, there's no way, I don't think, of putting any of this, any of this back in the bottle. If, if there is any silver lining, I hope, is that we are all now aware and that we hold whoever, whoever is the next president of the United States, Democrat or Republican, that we demand that they, that they um, act better and well, be see, better. Well, see, can I, can I just dovetail on that point, which is really before you and I kind of got into our little thing there. Which part? Uh, right. Oh. Uh, no, <laughs> I but love it's you, all, though. We do this all the time. You should see when she calls in the interview me, it's the it's same kind of conversation. <laughs> but, the, but the fact, no, I think it's an important point, which is why I said about uh, what I said about next year and subsequent years in not underestimating the voters. Folks, the most powerful words in our Constitution, uh, in our founding documents, we there's the just people. three little words, we the people. Mm -hmm. And from that, all authority flows to you. And the fact that, okay, we had what happened in 2016, notwithstanding, we can get into the science and the facts and the truth <laughs> of the lies of what happened and how it happened. But the question now for, for all of us is, Knowing what we know, seeing what we've seen, experiencing what we've experienced, how much more of this you want? And how, what are you going to do about it? And that's why I say that when I looked at Virginia, I saw voters taking, a little bit, taking back a little bit more control. And I'm curious as to how that plays out next year. Now, mm -hmm. it could be totally a one-off, and voters decide, no, we like this. We like the land of crazy. We'll just stay here and play. <laughs> Or they won't. It reminds me of 2006, having been on the ballot in 2006. And I know firsthand what that was like when the mood of the country was anything but favorable towards Republicans, anything favorable towards, uh, but favorable towards Republican candidates, regardless of how much they liked them, regardless of how much they thought they would do for them, they wanted to send a very clear message to the incumbent, since the incumbent was not on the ballot in 2006, that we've had enough. That then rounded itself out in 2008 with the election of Barack Obama and reestablished itself again in 2012. And remember what Republicans said on, in January of 2009, we'll do everything in our power to make this man a one-term president. But at the end of the day, who has the power? The people, we the, the people. people. But my, but, but Real quick. Fact, my, mm -hmm. my issue is, if you break it to try to break what's going on now, what is it going to look like? Because the same old things keep happening when people say we're going to break it. You know, the least of these programs for the least of these are always cut. Virginia and New Jersey were examples. But I want to see what happens with Kentucky. I want to see what happens in Mitch, Mitch McConnell's district, particularly in Appalachia, who thinks about, I want ACA. I want the Affordable Care Act. I could care less about Obamacare. 
There's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on. And I'm serious. That's they have true. Been, it's That's true. true. They have been brainwashed to believe that ACA and Obamacare are two totally different things because a black man was Obamacare. And ACA is tough. To, oh, I want ACA. I want to know, when we talk about fixing it, what are we fixing? It's not just the person there. It's something under... He is well, just, that goes to the people you nominate and elect. Mm -hmm. That's how you start the fix. So we, we, we got a lot of people. I'm so I want to I want to go oh, here. Sure. And if anyone knows where Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies is coming from, <laughs> um, if you, I mean, I love it since I was a kid. But please turn it off. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh. So my question is actually quite relevant to the current discussion. So, as the panel earlier said, Hillary was clearly the more qualified of the two candidates for the president. But you had, you had Mr. Trump dropping these shiny objects, and in the end, he's the one who got the vote. So do you think this represents a disinterest for policy in the mind of the American public? Well, I, I, would, I would say off the bat, the, the one very, there were a number of distinguishing moments in the 16 campaign for me. Uh, probably leading them off, though, was the fact that for the first time in many presidential cycles, there was very little interest in policy. Hmm. There you go. Hillary Clinton was, I mean, I, I read a lot of, of her, you know, there were beautiful treaties on, on <laughs> what everything. She, on everything, right? But Donald didn't Trump connect. didn't have one. I mean, Donald Trump on his website would say, yeah, we're going to build a wall. And how will you do it? How will it be and funded? Mexico's Nothing. going to pay for yeah. it. And that was pretty much it. And, 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 the, Mus and the Muslim ban was on there, too. Yeah. Right. And, and so the, the fact of the matter is I think a lot of voters had come to the conclusion that this whole policy thing was really another rabbit hole. They just weren't going to go down. So it didn't matter to them the policy positions yeah. and papers but you put out. Policy is what matters in the Pardon end. Pardon me? Policy is what's most important, right? These guys oh, yeah, are no. Oh, yeah, no. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, no. Saying, no. You're don't right. Get me wrong. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what we're saying. And that's what goes right. to the point that what I'm talking about. We would talk, we would watch everyone. You know, let's talk about when everyone had, I mean, it was like 25 people on the stage for the Republicans. You'd hear this one saying, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Right. And Donald Trump would say, and look at his hair. His hands are this. People tuned in for that. People right. would listen. Yes, the right. entertainment value. Because when you think about it, and this goes to this tax uh, reform plan right now versus ACA. ACA, it affected me. I understood it. The tax reform plan, a lot of people don't understand politics, and it's kind of heady, and they're like, oh, well, I'm going to get money, but they don't realize that... They in money. They don't realize <laughs> that if they do get money, it's going to cut off. Corporate America is going to get it. People don't get into the weeds of it because sometimes it is too heady. Yes. But we are more of a, of a group of people who we want to hear him every morning. He took advantage of the fact that people wanted to put him on the air every morning and the other candidates did not have the, the wisdom to say, let me pick up the phone and call and thwart him too. He played a totally different they entertainment were play, game. They were playing a different game. They were playing, they were a, different playing a different game. game. Just the the final, traditional game. Yeah, final point on, on, on that piece, though. I think it's also important to understand the Donald Trump voter. Huh. Donald Trump created that voter. Donald Trump had been creating that voter for about 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. They were his viewers before they were his voters. Mm, that was they good. were people who watched him, read about him on page six, saw him out and about, saw him being brash and bodacious and irreverent, and he brought that into politics, which is much more stoic You're and laid fine. back. Yeah, so on that stage, watching 15 other Republicans, governors, U.S. senators, businessmen and women go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the guy on the street who was just like, let's say, you got some funny-looking shoes on. I don't know what else you're talking about because I'm too busy looking at your shoes. People start listening, and what they do? Looked at the shoes. Looked at the hair, the hands, to, to the your, shoes. To your point about their hands, little, you know, your little hands, your little this, your little that. All of that became part of the narrative that his audience was accustomed to hearing and seeing. And then they got to the point where they moved off their couches, where they'd been sitting for a long time uninspired by politics, went to rallies, took up signs, and ultimately went to the polls. Question here. He's shutting us down. <laughs> All right, so it was uh, Mr. Steele, I believe. You said something along the lines of, like, um, you were talking about how for prospective politicians, auth being authentic should sort of be like a, a prere prerequisite. Um, 
And I'm wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Um, and I'm wondering how you would respond to a challenge on that, considering, uh, at least personally, when I turn on the TV or look to uh, you know many of the bigger politicians in this country, I don't necessarily see figures that I would describe as true, honest, right. authentic people. Okay. So, so yeah. I, I think you know, from my standpoint, um, you know, as someone who's been uh, a party official, a candidate, an elected official, I've kind of played in the sandbox for a long time and know it well. And then what I've learned from listening to people and watching how people respond is that they tend to, they do tend to respond more directly to you if they have a sense that you're being real. For example, a real moment in the campaign, the presidential campaign, um, there were two um, on the Republican side. One was with uh, Governor John Kasich. Mm. when he, when this young man in the audience was telling him his story and John, in that real moment, let down his politician's guard, embraced him, and they had this moment that everyone watched. The other one was with Chris Christie, when he told the story, uh, his own personal journey, uh, family journey with opioids and how that impacted, that authentic moment. Um, you didn't get that from Trump. You didn't have that sort of thing because it was all about it's the biggest, it's the greatest, it's the loudest. My, my argument going forward to candidates is, and it goes on and really in line with what you've been saying, that if you, if you go out there and you try to be Trump, you will not be fill in the blank, senator, governor, whatever, all right? Because people have that. And so now, post-Trump, and believe it or not, we are a little bit post-Trump, it's been 10 months and people are like, okay, is this like, okay, <laughs> really? <laughs> they're gonna be looking for certain, they're gonna, right, they're gonna be looking for certain qualities and my argument to those candidates is, be who you really are. Let people them see yeah, that right. and let them judge on that. Because right now, politicians are more interested in two things, getting elected and getting reelected, which is why I say to folks, just unelect them all right now and start over. Yeah. All right. It's, Question here. My name is Jackson. Do you think that Democrats have a better chance in 2018 and 2020 if they move towards the center and moderate as opposed to going down like a Bernie Sanders kind of path with socialism and all that? See, we didn't even talk about that. Ooh, it was more directed towards control. the chairman. I'm just curious to see what he has I to think, say. I think, I think, from well. what I see from my little crazy perch, I think there's <laughs> no gray area anymore. Um, you know, people, you want people, you want to see Washington work, but it's not working. And now you, you it's, it's either those who stand for what's right and those who play the game with the president. It's one or the other now. Mm -hmm. And I believe what's rising up is this resist, those who resist more so. Um, but then you have on the other side, those who support the president. If you don't support the president, you're a Republican, you may as well say you're done in these, these, these red districts, these solid red districts, Correct. you're right. done. But if you have a chance <clears throat> in a purple or in a blue, you, it's either one or the other. You rise up, you, it's, not, it's not center ground. It's I am for right, I am against this, and I'm for the people, whatever, you stand up. Or I'm for Trump and I'm with him. I'm for this brash way of cleaning the swamp. It's, it's no center anymore. But the question was, was about the Democrats and whether the Democrats right. need to go the Bernie route or go to the center. Chairman Steele, how about you jump in and then I'll give my thoughts on this. Well, I'm so, well I think, I, like I said, I don't think there's a center ground. I, so so here, here, here is one of, one of the most interesting moments I had in the 2016 uh, cycle at the Democratic National Convention. Wednesday evening around 6 p.m., I'm out in the corridor and uh, these five women I uh, run into um, uh, saw me and came up to me and it was the typical, what are you doing here? So, <laughs> so we had some laughs about the Republican at the Democratic National Convention. So I started to ask them questions because that's what I like to do to figure out where people are and what they're thinking. And so uh, this was uh, the day before Hillary was to give her nominating uh, speech. And this was the day that uh, a lot of the Bernie delegates were, how should we put it politely, pissed off uh, at the way uh, the procedures had be begun to flow. They couldn't get their voices heard. The vote seemed appeared stacked, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so I'm talking to them, and I asked them, I said, so, um, since Bernie's likely not to be the nominee of the party come November, who are you going to vote for? Three out of the five women said Donald Trump. Oh, no. So they did. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They did. Now, that is true, though. So, of course, I had the similar reaction and wanted to inquire further. And what I discovered, and you and I have talked about this before, Jonathan, is, again, as I looked at Occupy Wall Street and I looked at uh, tea party. the Tea Party, I looked at Donald Trump, and I looked at Bernie Sanders. And they were each two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. The politics had come so far around that they had met at a point where there actually existed in the 2016 election a Bernie Democrat Sanders, Donald Trump Republican. voter. Yep. In fact, it led me to believe and to write back in October of 2015 that the parties would nominate Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And I believe to this day, had Bernie Sanders gotten caught on fire earlier, or had another two to three weeks on the back end, he would have been the nominee of the party. And it goes exactly to your point, that internal friction inside the Democratic Party is very, not that dissimilar from what's been playing out in the Republican Party. The only difference is ours has been going on since Reagan left, yours has been going on since the last tail end of Obama. And, and I would argue that if Bernie Sanders had been the nominee, he would, he would have lost well, that wasn't because the question. No, 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 I understand. I'm just, no, no, here we go I'm about not the responding to his question. I'm responding to what you said. I, I but now to your, to your, to your I never question. said who would win. I just okay, said no. they would both be the nominees. Right. Because no, that's I'm how just the saying electorate. what would have happened. Well, what had happened was. So <sighs> here's, here's, here's what I would say in terms of your question of should the party move, move to the center or go with Bernie. I think the party should nominate candidates for every elective office who are genuine as Michael Steele said, who speak to the issues in their respective districts, right. as we saw um, with the, can the, the candidate in Virginia who talked about traffic and transportation. Right, she won. And here's the key thing. A lot of people were really upset in Virginia that Tom Perriello didn't get, the, didn't get the Democratic nomination for governor. He was endorsed by Bernie Sanders. He was the progressive candidate. Right. He was a very good candidate, and both policy-wise and appearance-wise, he was a very attractive young candidate, but he didn't get the nomination. And a lot of folks in the Bernie section of the Democratic Party said, see, the establishment has done it again. They should have gone with Tom Perriello. He would have won. You've blown it again. And what ended up happening? Tom Perriello did lose the nomination, but the very next day and every day through Election Day campaigned his heart out for Northam went out there, my Facebook feed, Twitter feed, filled with campaign events that Perriello was doing enthusiastically and eagerly for Northam, mm -hmm. who won. Not by a few points, as some people said, no, but by oh, nine. And so the key to, to my mind in that race is, yes, there are supposed to be frictions within, within parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. But if, the party, if either party wants to win, and in this case, if the Democrats want to win, they must coalesce behind that person who gets the nomination and ensure that that person wins the seat, whatever that seat is. Because as, what we're, see as we're seeing right now, that if a Democrat, oh, let's put it this way, if Hillary Clinton were president of the United States, I don't think we would, ha we have, we would have had 90% of the conversation we we're having right now. Mm -hmm. Because we know where she would be and we would be in agreement or at least not horrified well, by what by totally what we've seen. But you not total the, agreement. Now, yeah, you would no, have you. the Bernie you know people the, jumping up in her face, right. saying, pushing the envelope for for going the way, she, going yeah, the for the left. That's, yeah, but that's a pol but that would be so a policy argument. Would policy. Yeah. That would yeah. those would have been policy we'd be arguments. More policy now than we're talking politics. Right, and we wouldn't Sanders be talking about the loss of the Say that again. A lot of the Sanders people aren't pragmatic. They want this big crazy vision that you know it's kind of hard to. Hard to plan if you stick to the old blue dog sort of you know strategy well, things. Well, that's right. Right. that is the can I real test because we've got. Can I just give you a little bit of advice on on that statement? Mm -hmm. Therein lies the rub. When you sit there and you go, well, a lot of those people aren't pragmatic. That tells them you're not listening to what I'm saying. You've judged what I've said before I, because you don't agree with me, and that goes to the core of what's wrong with our politics today is that we're quick to judge. So when Hillary uses the term deplorable, 
meaning whatever she meant to mean, mm -hmm. the people who heard it, so you can, okay, I got something deplorable for you. And that's, and that's okay. the state of our politics right now. We are more quick to judge each other than to listen. Okay, question here. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Ariel. Um, this is for um, Michael Steele. Uh, I feel I spend more time arguing about being subjugated or bullied than actually being a part of, inc of inclusivity. So as a young woman of color, how do I deal with political decisions and its crucial ties with prejudices in my classes? Mm. And to April, when do you think it is enough as far as women of color constantly being ostracized because of how we feel and we speak out, mm. knowing automatically we are considered the least attractive, less likely to succeed, less likely to even reach 21 without having a child or being on welfare. So how okay. can it pos I'm sorry, how as a, another woman of color, how can I possibly make a path where I have all the networks and ensure, to ensure my future as well? Okay, we only have five, five minutes left, so make your answers very brief I'll, so we can get I'll through. just real quick, and, you know, just because I got a short time, the, the short answers for me is you just did the most powerful thing you can do, and that's use your voice to make sure that people know where you stand and tell them, no, nah, baby, this is my space. Now, if you want to come into it, you got to be with me on this. If you're not, fine, just step away. So whether you're in class, whether you're in business, whether you're in your community, your voice is the one that's going to matter most to you. And you have to be authentic and feel strong in that. You, just because someone else thinks something or says something, going back to what I was saying over here, um, that's not the point. Don't get distracted by that. Because the goal is to lessen your voice and to make it weaker and have less value, now is the time for it, it to rise and stand firm. April? Um, I think what you need to do is first, as Michael said, I mean, you, you stand up, speak out. Um, be you, be authentically you, but at the same time, find your space and, and grind and don't look, there are gonna always be bar barriers. Mm -hmm. There will always be barriers. Just find a way to go over them and just keep on moving. Go around them if you have to. Or under. Or under, or yes. Them. Make the way because Blow there is up. a way for you. And, when, and I'm going to give you something that someone very poignant gave me. If you keep sowing that seed, you keep sowing that seed, you keep sowing that seed, a harvest is going to come up somewhere. So I encourage you, my sister. Thank you so much. Que question here. Well, good evening. Um, uh, my question is in response to what the professor asks. As a black professor man, Lewis? Uh, no, the professor. The other professor. Yeah, the other oh, professor. Yeah. Oh, okay. As a black man who grew up in um, not so rich neighborhoods or not so suburb neighborhoods, where would it lie for me to sit in a, in a party in the United States of America if he says the Republican Party is trying to decimate or disintegrate the black community and the Democrat Party mm. is keeping us stagnant? Where Can do, I say something? Where do I sit? I want to say Go something. Ahead. Yes, let me say this to you. I'm going to give you what um, Real fast. Shirley Chisholm said, the late Shirley Chisholm said, ran for president in 1972. She said, if, there, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Now, the issue is where do you place that folding chair? Mm -hmm. For the Re Republican Party, oh, they've got some issues. And they've got a leader right now who is throwing out issues of race, but you could be that one that makes a difference inside that party. And when it comes to Democrats, stagnant, whatever, you could be the one who makes a difference inside that party. It's all upon what you choose. I can't tell you, we can't tell you, he's gonna tell you to be a Republican. No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, you're not? Oh, okay, okay. Oh. Please, don't get that twisted. Please. Oh, I like oh. this, tell I've, us. I've never, I've never, I've never said to anyone, you should be. Okay. Never said that because, right. I mean, in fact, I got in trouble as chairman, county chairman, national chairman, state chairman, when it came to voter registration because I'm like, y'all just come. I want to register everybody. And they're like, no, we just re registered Republicans. I said, no, I want to register voters because that's what it's about. My test as a party official is to make the case to the voters, mm -hmm. all right? So if you don't like the case I'm making, guess who that's on? That's on me. That's not on you. I can't then go change the voting rules because I can't make the case for you to vote for me. Although. Although, <laughs> although that's what they do. Right. So to your point, so, I mean, just real quick, I know. To your point <laughs> about, about, about what do you do, um, you, haven't, you haven't really figured it out until you have been a black Roman Catholic conservative mm. Republican from Washington, D.C. Mm. And every single day you get up and you make the choice to remain a black Roman Catholic conservative Republican now from Maryland. 
all right? The fact, the point is, you decide where you want to be, and you go into that space, and you own it. Yeah. And you make people respect you Amen. Because by showing them what you can do. I didn't want to be a county chairman, didn't want to be state chairman, didn't want to be lieutenant governor or anything else. It fell, I took the opportunity, and here we are. Mm. So you seize those moments. You bring that chair into the room, and you put it at the table. Mm -hmm. When they try to move the table, you move the chair with it. Thank you. All right, so once, ma'am, ma'am, please. So there are five, there are five of Real you, and we've got, we've got two minutes. So I want you to each rapid fire one question and 15 seconds. Rapid fire. We all talked to about tonight how Donald Trump has been trying to appeal to a far right wing section of his 33% of supporters. Do you think he's doing that because as our, com our, as our country becomes more and more polarized where people express their prejudice on the daily without guilt, without hesitation, do you think he's appealing to these people because they're increasingly taking a large role in our society, becoming leaders as they have historically always done in polarized times? Okay. I think real quick, it goes, yep. I, it goes to what April said earlier. People feel that they've been put on and disenfranchised. He gives them voice. They gravitate towards that until a different voice comes along. The Democrats can make a better argument, if you will, uh, or Republicans stand up and, and push back on a better argument. They're going to stay in that space. Next. Governor, oh, oh, okay. So why does he Governor, go to the white no, supremacy? No, no, one question. Governor Wilder said, Governor Wilder said, Governor Doug Wilder, then Governor Doug Wilder said. Of oh, Virginia. Yeah, Virginia. He said, um, when people, when their pocketbooks are hurting or their pockets are hurting, that's when people are angry and they lash out. But when you're in good times and everything's fine, you don't have anything to worry about. You're not fighting. So it, again, it goes back to what I said earlier. If your money's funny, you're, you're not right. Next question. Real fast. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, question, what is the legal threshold for violation of the Logan Act? Ooh. Oh, okay. Mm. Or is that even? Uh, that's by even the way, this, this doesn't like, apply to party. I just yeah, want to no, know yeah, the legal yeah, definition. No, no. Um, yeah, but isn't it about the party in power if they, if they decide to push it forward? I believe I think that is the case where yeah, the party in power yeah, decides yeah. to to impress. The, the the reality of it is the Logan Act has to do with private citizens uh, engaging in discussion, negotiating, or whatever with foreign, foreign policy, with foreign foreign policy with foreign governments. Yeah, that that's part of the storyline of what happened in the transition, if not even before uh, the election in, in the Trump campaign. And the question becomes whether or not the party in power is going to then apply that law. My short answer would be probably not. Probably not. Next Thank question. You. And, and like you've been, you've been waving all night. All right, the, the price is right. No, here, in front of the, the microphone real fast. Right, yeah. right. So what do we do about the fact that, yes, we the people and the vote schmote, but <laughs> this administration, they're, they're, they're suppressing the voting situation, voting rights, right. no consent decree anymore. And, and what about that? I mean, it, it's hopeless. I'm, no, it's I'm, not. No, it is not. It is not okay. hopeless. Give me hope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just, I'm sorry, I just got to go back to the basics. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, you're right, it's not hopeless. You have, you have all the power. Um, we go back and we look at how people did not participate in the last election for whatever reason that they decided not to participate. Um, I tell people, I've always told them, if you don't vote, don't talk to me about why you're mm -hmm. pissed off exactly. or concerned. Right. I don't really care. So having said that, um, it is, it is, I think incumbent then for people to take control the only way they really can, and that's at the ballot box. You'll have that opportunity next year. You don't like the direction this administration is going in. You don't like this president. You don't like anything about what's going on. Then send a signal to the United States Congress, right, and to the United States Senate. The only thing that they know and respect is what you do at that ballot box. And when they wake up on Wednesday morning and they find they don't have a job, there you are. Covering the White House the way I've covered for the last 20 years, your hope lies within yourself, each and every one of you. And the reason why I say that, I'm gonna give you a, a very close example that you can relate to. January 20th, 2017, I was able to walk through crowds for Inauguration Day. It's not myth, it's not conjecture, it was real. Crowds were thin. But a couple of women, 
A couple of women the next day decided to walk around Lansing, Michigan, around Sydney, Australia, in London, England, in New York City, uh, in Los Angeles, um, in Atlanta, and in Washington, D.C. Those women made enough of a noise and, and their numbers were too big to ignore. It caused the, the former White House press secretary to come out to that podium in this ill-fitting suit <laughs> and scream about crowd size. Yeah. They saw it. Right. And they that's saw right. it. And that's if the strength. that's it, and if it continues, if people of like minds, and I'm not pushing an agenda, but if people of like minds, th there's a blueprint of this, the civil rights movement, look it up. But if people of like minds come together, they, they get the squeaky wheel in Washington gets you off. They're consistent and persistent. Mm -hmm. They listen. Can I, just, and I, know, and I know you guys. I just want to, just one more example for you. What is the popularity of the United States Congress right now? 17%? Right. <laughs> 17%? 18%? <laughs> Single it, digits, nine yeah. percent. He's a stats now, it's all, right, he's, he's a good. statistician right, right he there. He knows, yes. All right, so where are you going? Here we're going. Next year, ninety-eight percent of them will get reelected. Yeah. So you the tell me, you. you tell me who controls the power: the person who wants you to elect them, or the person who elects them. And the only thing, other thing that I would add is something that April said to the. Um, the black women here in the, in the hat and the gold sweater is that when it comes to obstacles, people are putting obstacles in the way of people voting. You have to go around it, over it, under it, but that means finding out what the laws are and That's the rules right. are in your state ahead of time. 2020 is coming, 2018 is coming. Learn the laws in, in your respective districts and do everything you can to get the vote. Next question. Thank you. Hello, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, yes. So I'm a conservative. And welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and so, something that I've noticed is that is that especially here in New York, especially at MLU. Um, so personally, by the way, I just want to clarify: I dislike Trump, and I think Roy Moore should be in prison. Um, but that being said, I've noticed that whenever people come out as conservative, they're usually labeled as either sexists, racists, bigots, um, or automatically liking Donald Trump, okay. uh, which I just don't think is true. So as a conservative, um, who is a conservative for very, very particular beliefs, what would you maybe give advice for, for me, um, in being comfortable speaking and asking questions? I have the perfect person to answer that question, Chairman Steele. <laughs> Trying to slide well, me. I feel your pain. No. <laughs> I, feel I know, your pain. I know. It's not, look, it's not, it's not, this is not an easy environment at all. Uh, never has been. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I can promise you it probably won't be in the future. But that's fine. What I, it goes back to a lot of what we've been saying. The key thing is to understand what makes you a conservative. You know what that day you got up and decided, yeah, this is who I am. Remember that. Mm -hmm. What you see now, a lot of Republicans who've forgotten that, who've written that off. I can assure everyone in this house that if Ronald Reagan came back and ran for elective office today, he would lose in a Republican primary. Mm. The same man who raised taxes as governor, the same man who supported and put in place a, 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 a national uh, immigration policy that today would be considered uh, amnesty. amnesty, all right? That man would not win as much as they preach Ronald Reagan. They don't know Ronald Reagan. They don't understand Ronald Reagan which is one of my biggest frustrations. We can have a, a huge policy debate on what worked and what didn't work and talk about him showing up in Mississippi or wherever and doing the camp. We can talk Philadelphia, about Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Mississippi. Yeah, we can talk about all of that. That's huge in we civil can, rights. And no, it is. Yeah. No, I, I know yeah, all that, but, but, go on. but this go is on. my point. This is my point. We can talk about that and probably have a fairly rational conversation around it because we can anchor to something, some principles or ideals that we value. What you need to do is start in that space. And don't let Steve Bannon, don't let Donald Trump, don't let anyone else define for you what a conservative is today. Because I'm going to tell you something. The roots of our party were, are, were, were rooted together by Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. They have their roots in libertarianism, where we believe very firmly in the government spending as little time in your bedroom and your home as possible. That was the old Republican Party that talked about environmentalism. We were the party that advocated and, and, and pushed those policies forward. Teddy Roosevelt, for example. So a lot of Nixon this stuff. Nixon and the EPA. The EPA. 
Republicans rail against affirmative action. Hello, we created it, right? Nixon. Nixon. So the, that lack of understanding of history, that lack of understanding of foundation, has led us to the space we're in right now. So you be you, be the conservative you want to be. I don't get to define that. You get to do that every day. Next question. And last question. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Elrond Oz. I'm a student here. Mr. Capehart, earlier you said uh, that kind of with the Trump administration, politics as we know it has been thrown out the window and we don't know it, anything really anymore. As a politics student, what advice do you have of learning about this in kind of a, a new kind of society that no one really right. understands yet? This goes, this goes back to both what April has said um, and what Chairman Steele has said. Has said. You, have to know, you have to know your history. The reason why I can say that politics has just been blown up is because I know what it was. And so in order for you to know um, where we are now, you need to know where we've been. So that way, when we dig ourselves out of this, you will know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you're uh, great. You're a poli-sci major. I'm a, I was a poli-sci major. And so what you're, what you're learning is where we've been. And the great thing, another silver lining, I'm always looking for the pony in the pile. That's all right. That's good. But, um, but the other silver lining is I do believe that we will dig our way out of this and we will find our way back to where we were and who we were as an American people. And you, as a poli-sci major, now undergrad, yeah. you will get to watch that in real time. You will get to be a part of that in real time. You will all get to be a part of that in real time, either for the first time like you, or for maybe the second or third time, depending on where you are, where you are in life. But on that note, I want to thank all of you for being here, for your great questions. Michael Steele, April Ryan, thank you very much. I love you. <laughs>